Good morning, Welcome, Mary. everybody. Today is uh, another installment of the Inspired Teachers podcast. I'm really excited today. My guest is Matt Parsons. Uh, last month, I was on his podcast, uh, Syncretic Qigong and Reiki, and I had such a great time, and it was so much fun. I asked Matt to uh, come on to my podcast. So today, uh, I'm going to turn the tables on Matt. I'm going to be asking him some questions, and this is going to be high energy and lots of fun. So uh, stick around, stay tuned, and uh, and join us. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Today, I'm here with Matt Parsons. Um, my friend Paul Gallagher one time said the best thing about Taiji is Taiji friends. Um, and I've expanded that out because uh, I practice lots of different martial arts and healing arts. And uh, one thing I found is that there's this there's this amazing brotherhood and sisterhood of people who practice martial arts, who who sacrifice their time, energy and attention to um, to work on their art, work on themselves. And uh, meeting Matt, I immediately felt like the same thing. Oh, uh, here's another one of the fraternity. Uh, I felt really, really had a good time talking with him. And uh, I just thought, all right, I'd really like to, uh, I'd like to grill him and put this guy on the hot seat. So everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Matt Parsons. Hi, guys. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you so much, Ray, for having me on. I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, so... Um, you uh, sent me a list of questions, so I, I'm just ready to go off of that. <laughs> so, you know, here's the here's the first question, which is basically, um, you know, how did we meet? Because uh, I meet a lot of different people in a lot of different ways now. And uh, so uh, if you could just tell my, my audience uh, how you and I met and how we are here today. Well, you know, uh, being a millennial, I use the Internet for just about everything in my life. I've, I've been using, uh, you know, dial up when I was like four or five years old. So, um, you know, through the years, I did a lot of uh, Kung Fu networking, like you were talking about a moment ago, those those Kung Fu friends that we meet along the, the way. And, uh, you know, the internet has been an integral part of socialization for people of my generation. So um, I connected with uh, Jason Eaton on a community a few years back. And, you know, he's spoken so highly of you through the years. And, um, he's a Taiji guy. I'm a Hingi Bagua guy. Um, so, you know, like we have some discussions about, you know, like what these arts are and like the different body mechanics and, you know, like how they kind of manifest. And he's like, you know, you really should reach out to Ray, um, if you're interested in La Habafa. So, um, I got your book, Real Gold Does Not Fear the Fire when it came out. And ever since then, I've just been uh, trying to keep in contact and follow what you do online and, uh, you know, talk to Jason through the years. And, and now I'm really glad to make your acquaintance and, and speak with you, uh, you know, publicly and, you know, over the phone, you've been really generous with your time. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's been fun, not only doing podcasts with you and, uh, but uh, talking and texting and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a really good connection. I uh, appreciate that. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, you've got a, a unique healing journey and a martial arts journey, and I know that they dovetail. And um, uh, I, you know, a lot of people come to martial arts either through great strength or great weakness. You know, right. being uh, needing to heal or needing to channel that. And uh, myself and my teacher and my grand teacher, we all came from that needing to heal and then finding the strength. And um, it seems to me that that might be your story too. If you would share a little bit of that, uh, I think it's a fascinating fascinating for the audience glad to um so this this actually goes back to my childhood um when i was a kid i did um shingo school of aikido through hikatsuchi michio to uh john smart sensei to uh, matt flutie was my primary instructor so john smart would head up the school and matt flutie was the guy who taught the kids classes um and so he was a uh in, uh, I guess the word would be like a instructor uh, apprentice um, 
to John Smart Sensei. And so that was my my experience in martial arts starting from a very young age. And my family's um, were from Stockton, California, which is a very rough place. And my extended family is involved in organized crime. And, you know, I'd have uncles who are like, oh, you're doing Aikido now. How about if uh, I kick you in the face? Uh, you know, I'm 10 years old. And <laughs> uncles just, you know, shoving a boot at me. So <laughs> got to work it, right? Um, <laughs> so it, it was kind of an intense thing. My grandfather growing up, um, he was involved with cockfighting pretty heavily and he was a breeder of roosters for decades. And so that was what I did in the summer times is I'd work the farm in the ghetto, uh, try not to get killed, you know, defend the house with the 357, uh, 10 years old, that sort of thing. <laughs> and, and yeah, Stockton was a rough place in the nineties. So we had um, like crack houses exploding down the street and fires and gun drive-bys and, you know, uh, I got in a lot of fights uh, being as pale as I am and, and being mixed with Mexican. Uh, my dad is is Mexican. So, um, you know, he was never around though. So nobody knew, right? They just were like, oh, he's part of that, that white supremacist family. And I was like, whoa, you know, like this is what my family's involved with. And so I was in an abusive home environment growing up. And my stepfather broke my face um, from basically my hairline down to the opposite side below my eye. And um, that set me up later in life for some strokes. And um, basically what they think happened was when I was on an antidepressant, um, I had gone through a, a, a bit of a drinking binge after my grandfather passed away. And um, apparently you're not supposed to be on that antidepressant with any alcohol whatsoever. <laughs> so, uh, the combination of, you know, the, the blood clots floating around in my skull and the heart issues that I experienced with the drug interaction, the alcohol, um, I had a stroke at the age of 23 <clears throat> and, uh, I was paralyzed, um, on the left side of my body, basically from my face down to my foot. Um, my foot would curl up. My hand was curled up like this. So it's kind of hunched over. Um, wow. yeah, it was, it was pretty brutal and, uh, I nearly drank myself to death. <laughs> um, it was, uh, it was a pretty difficult time in my life. Um, about what age is this? I was 23 years old. About 23 when this was happening. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I'd wow. been 23 for about, I think, uh, three months at that time. <laughs> so, wow. yeah. Um, nearly drank myself to death and a little bit later, in my uh, life, my good friend who was my mentor in the tobacco industry, he's like, um, you know, I could show you some Tai Chi <laughs> and uh, some Qigong and, and meditation. And, uh, you know, there, there was an Affordable Care Act. Obamacare hadn't come into place yet. So, you know, pre-existing conditions were you know, impossible to get medical care without, you know, either a really good job, but I was an IT contractor, you know, so... Um, no health insurance there and um yeah so he's he offered to teach me tai chi and i'm running this cigar website and learning tai chi in a cigar factory at night and no joke ray within about three and a half months i i was able to just walk with um knee braces i didn't need the cane anymore and um I got assistance from a John Barnes trained myofascial released um, massage therapist, Karen Sue Bravo, and she helped me remobilize my left hand. And that was, that was really great. And um, just did a bunch of silk reeling in a chair for months at a time. <laughs> and eventually um, my mobility came back. Uh, took a long time. I basically relearned to walk with Jan Zhuang and <laughs> Taiji Chen. Wow. And, um, yeah, so, you know, that was one thing that I, I really valued through that experience, um, is that these Chinese martial arts have like this whole physical therapy curriculum behind it. And, 
in the last few years, I've been really fortunate to have good medical coverage and be able to go to the physical therapist and that sort of thing and address my strength deficiencies. And, you know, like yesterday I was there and they're like, well, we want you to do a poo-boo. I'm like, oh, or, you know, sitting in a squat, you know, so I get into poo-boo stance and get low and go back and forth with these TRX cables. Like, oh yeah, this is great. I don't have to worry about my upper body so much. And they're like, uh, you, you don't have to be that low. I'm like, well, where do you need me to feel this? And, these places like yeah, I need to be this low to feel it there <laughs> you know so there, there's a, a different level of physical ability um that comes about after you know doing these things for so many years you know like my physical therapists even though I have you know chronic pain and, and these sort of things they're always amazed like how is he this flexible and strong and you know he can get lower and do more than our other people even then you know I quit because I have psoriatic disease and my fatigue is just like okay I'm done uh, massage me now but you know. <laughs> It's, I love uh, when I go to the doctors, like, can you touch your toes? And then I can touch my toes, no problem. And when I was younger, I used to also drop into a split just to kind of go, <laughs> uh, I think my flexibility is okay. Yeah, they're like, can you touch your toes? I'm putting my palms flat on the ground. I'm like, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that that is one thing that I, I've really valued um, from these arts and learning what I have um, is the the physical recovery. Um, you know, from my childhood and, and family background, I, I knew how to fight, you know, like I didn't come to Kung Fu to, to fight, you know, and but I still want to, you know, like it's fun. Um, growing up, I, I had a best friend in high school who had like multiple like degree black belts in different arts and he did kickboxing tournaments and yeah, we beat the crap out of each other in sword fight, you know, like... <laughs> What else are you going to do when you have martial arts experience and you have too much testosterone going through you? <laughs> Got to see if it works, you know? Right. You can't do right. it in front of the teacher. They always say no, but they always <laughs> encourage you. They'd say, yeah, go check it out on your own. Well, you know, you know? I, I really valued my relationship with him because there was a school, um, Green Mantis Kung Fu, um, near where we are. And there, there's an old school Bagua guy there. And so my friend, you know, when he first moved to town, he's like, oh, I'll go check out the different martial arts schools. And, you know, he went over to the Bagua and Xingyi school and just cleared house with all of his students. He's like, oh, I don't want to learn that. <laughs> um, they can't do anything. Um, and, and so, you know, having somebody with that level of expertise, you know, gave me an idea as to where I should go study because he had kind of gone around to these different places to check it out. And, one of the people that he, um, you know, really respected was was Ash Higgs for Yi Li Chuan. He's like, yeah, that guy's got it. Whatever it is that they do there, it's super traditional, but it, you know, that that's some good stuff. <laughs> and, and then he um, he told me, you know, there were you know a few other people throughout the town, but um, you know, he didn't really see much value in doing that study until I got really sick. And then he's like, oh, you're getting better pretty fast. You know, uh, Tai Chi must be doing something for you. <laughs> so what arts do you, what arts do you train? What are you doing now? What's your, what's your martial arts uh, uh, practice or, you know, tell me what you like to do. So I do uh, Jiang Bagua primarily. That's my, my primary art. Um, and I'm learning Yang Tai Chi. And um, I used to do Chi. Chen Tai Chi. I haven't done that in years since my teacher left the country. So, um, yeah, and I do. Yi Chuan, I do Xing... you do. You have a standing practice every day. Yeah, I have. I have Han Shi Yi Chuan. Um, I've learned a couple of versions of Yi Chuan now, and I primarily do the Han Xing Chao stuff because that's my weekly instructor uh, for that art. Um, he, we work on the Han Xing Chao material primarily, but we also have some of the older Yi Chuan from Henry Look, and I've done a little bit of that with, um, I recently met Doug Corpolongo, and I've been going through his material on the website and, and training with one of his students, um, and we go through a little bit of Yi Chuan in the Tai Chi class, so yeah, I, I really value that, that Jan Zhang uh, material that we have, and seeing the contrast between the older Yichan and the newer Yichan is very interesting to me. Um, so yeah, that's that's my primary thing, Xing Yi Bagua Yichan. Um, I'm learning Yang Taiji primarily because, you know, you gotta have 
you know, a, a group of people, right? <laughs> most people want to do Taiji. They don't want to do Xingyi, Bagua, Yichan. You know, they don't want to set up the mattresses and get launched into a room or, you know, punched or thrown, you know, that sort of thing. They want to do push hands and the form in the park and have a nice time. And hey, you know, that's cool. So <laughs> when I met Master Leon, he told me, you know, learn Xingyi, Bagua and do standing. And, um, I, you know, I asked him to teach me and he said, no, 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 I'm not qualified. I don't do it, you know. Uh, go find a teacher. And so, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, whatever. And I met Paul Gallagher and he said, do you have a standing practice? And I said, nah, I can't stand. I got to move. I got to do stuff. And he went, you'll have a standing practice. And now whatever, <laughs> 35 years later, uh, if I don't do standing every day, um, uh, you know, I just don't feel good. And it doesn't matter how long I do it. Um, when, when COVID came, I stopped, you know, I had all the time in the world. And I did all my standing by feeling. And now, um, I, you know, with class, you have to do it. You know, I don't want an hour class to be 40 minutes of standing. Um, but sometimes Unless it's the focus body, for that day, right? <laughs> I'll stand and there's a connection and I'm done. And other times I got to wait for that connection. And it is truly, um, it's truly one of my favorite uh, practices. So, yeah, you and I really need to, we need to talk about that in depth. Uh, Master Choi, obviously, is a big, uh, big proponent of uh, Yi Chuan. Yeah, that waiting aspect of that that feeling to arise, the Zhong Tai state, that that can be the most difficult part sometimes when you're standing. Just okay, where is that connection? Where is it? <laughs> oh, you mean patience? Right. <laughs> Having a little patience. You know, I want to feel really good and connected in mind body harmony right now. Well, yeah, that's yeah. that's when you're a master, you can get it right now. When you're learning, uh, it takes a while. One um, thing I that asked really Master Choi when he, um, oh, go ahead. after he retired, you know, and I asked him about his daily practice, which I'm going to ask you a little more detail in just a second. But I said to him, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, wh what do you do for your daily practice? And, you know, how long, how long does it take you to do your main form or your Taiji? He told me, he said, uh, to do the Liho Bafa main form, it took him a whole week. And I said, it took you a week? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I practice until it feels perfect. And once it feels perfect, I stop. I don't finish the form. Mm. And I'm like, what? I mean, that's totally foreign concept to me. And then he said, yeah, because what's after perfect is imperfect. And he'd say, day one, I might get through 20, 30 movements. It feels perfect. I'm done for the day. And then the next day, I pick up where that is. And that's how it took him a week to do the form. Which um which it was uh very liberating for me because I tried that with some of my practices and um you know it was a lot better to check in with how it felt than have a beginning middle and end. Yeah. So what's yeah, your and... what do you what's your daily practice? What do you like to do and do you change it seasonally? I know you're in that that very nice climate down there, but uh, <laughs> up here in Minnesota, seasonal training is really a huge thing. Yeah, seasonal training here is kind of the opposite from where you are, um, because in the summer times we have, you know, 120 plus degrees sometimes. And so being out in that is pretty brutal. Uh, don't get me wrong. I've definitely done Santi training in 122 uh, when I trained with Lloyd Day. Um, but there's there's a difference, right? So the summertime you do a lot of indoor training, and then wintertime it's outdoor training. So like this is about the most I have to wear usually for wintertime out here. And um, yeah, I, I love the wintertime. I can uh, go out there and practice for two three hours at a time, including my seated meditations. So um, yeah, my my seasonal training is is basically kind of flip flop. We do indoor in the summer and outdoor in the winter, um, and then you know, we don't really have the same like spring and fall like other places do. So it's basically hot until it's not. <laughs> and, and um, you know, the spring is, is pretty brutal as far as pollen and all that goes. There's a lot of trees and stuff through the years that, you know, since people have moved in with the urban explosion, that's, it's made it into a terrible place for allergies now. <laughs> I mean, one so, thing we notice here in the winter, I mean, we have the same, you, you're absolutely right. For us, summertime, cracks outside, wintertime, inside. One thing we really notice is that, uh, I mean, it gets brutally cold up here. Your body will constrict. It gets tighter. It conserves energy, um, you know, stretching and things like that. So, uh, you know, we have to we have to train accordingly. Do you notice that at all down where you are? 
Yeah, I do. I do notice it quite a bit. Um, so once it starts to warm up, I feel my body loosen up and I can ooh, feel all wiggly. But as soon as, like I said, it's hot until it's not. So there's like that one cold week and then, you know, it's, it's, it's that way for the rest of the time. And um, yeah, so the, the colder months, I typically am going out and doing a lot more active stuff. So I like to do shingy line drills, you know, that sort of thing um to keep my warmth <laughs> or uh fast circle walking is really great for that too and um uh, fajin flavored tai chi you know get the energy flowing is, is good um but my daily practice you know that that is right now primarily bagua chong um alex cosma has been putting out these video courses for um his Zhang Jiaodong material that he learned from Serga Auge. Um, so that comes through Wang Shujin. And I've been working on that just to get a, a slightly different idea as to what Zhang Jiaodong may have taught. Because, um, you know, Zhang Rang Chao was a very accomplished person. He studied with a number of people. And um, I feel like his Bagua Zhang particularly has so many different influences in it. It's it's kind of hard to see the Chung in there. So I, I really appreciate that um, material that Alex Cosmos put out um, because I get to see where the Chung Ting Wa flavor is in the Zhang Zhaodong material, um, as opposed to Zhang Rang Chao, who had like completely reformulated things into his own thing. So it's it's a it's a good contrast. So we'll have to talk, you know, we have, we have many things to talk about. Yi Chuan, we'll have to talk about that first set of eight changes from Wang Xu Jin. Um, Cause I learned it from two different students, direct students of Wang Xu Jin. Mm. Um, and there's an interesting history that, it, but it's, it's a, uh, that's, that's for you and I to discuss. Right. I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you about that. So yeah, when I you looked um, at uh, Kent Howard's book the other day at the library and I was like, yeah, this is really close. Not quite the same flavor, but, you know, Alex Cosmo is probably a lot taller than Wang Shu Jin was. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and again, um, yeah, there's there's different the different masters, uh, especially in Bagua, because, uh, you know, swimming dragon or swimming body, those are forms, but that's a level. And that's right. like jazz improv. And so one day the master might improv a certain way. Might one day the master might improv uh, a different way. Um, and so depending on which one you got that day, might may color that uh, that form. Um, so when you're doing bagua, like what do you start out with? What do you what do you like to make sure you do every day? Give me a little bit of idea about your bagua practice. So my everyday thing for sure is the Kenny Gong five exercises. Those are um, a Xingyi and bagua ne gong set. Um, that are put together to correspond to the five elements. And then, you know, so that's that's my number one thing that I do every day, um, just because it's a real treasure, it's starting to go away, and I want to make sure that it lives. So that's you know, one thing that I do every day is, is these five exercises. And then the other things that I do every day is the, the five element linking form, um, no matter what. I may not work on the individual elements every day, but I do work on the linking form every single day. Um, and then circle walking. Um, lately, I've been trying to pick up the eight inner palms uh, static forms that you put up online. Uh, that's been a really interesting exploration um, to see how that is um, and how it could correlate to the eight old eight palms that I already know. Uh, like the more traditional Jiang Rang Chao set and, uh, you know, how they interact with each other. And, and so one of the things I've been experimenting with lately is, is using the static postures to correlate to different palms in the old eight palms and uh, trying to explore the energetic signatures of that uh, with the Yi Jing. So, um, you know, I, I kind of, uh, give myself some energetic and thought experiments and then go practice just to keep it interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, aliens didn't invent martial arts. It was never given to us perfectly. It was, you know, it, it's really been passed on from person to person to person. Um, I always joke with people. I say, okay, uh, you know, if you don't know acupuncture, I'll give you one needle in one point. Now discover all of acupuncture. You know, you can't do it. It right. was it was generation. One one person knew a point, another person knew a point, and then that student 
studied with those two people. Now they got two points and then they might have discovered one and then, okay, then the person studied with them, there's three and, it, and it's, it's like that. And the same thing with these, with martial arts. I mean, uh, you know, five fists, eight palms, uh, you know, eight movements. There's, there's lots of, uh, lots of basics and we are supposed to be scientists and experiment and research and, uh, you know, discover, you know, Master Liang would say, uh, have many teachers read many books, but only by your daily practice can you discover the truth. And um, right, the secret you know, scars like a scientist <laughs> when you uh, when you do it day after day, you're doing your research, you're in your Bagua lab, finding out mm -hmm. how does this thing feel, how does that thing feel. Um, for me, being a professional teacher, um, you know, I got I got a huge laboratory. I, I people come back the next week with their practice, and I get to see how many different practices. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting like that. Uh, you know, Master Choi would always say, uh, you want to respect me, uh, then believe what I say. But if you really want to respect me, prove for yourself that what I said is true. Right. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not disrespectful to doubt. It's disrespectful to doubt without going back and practicing that. Right. If you just write something off and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like standing. I mean, I was, I was disrespectful. I'm like, yeah, I, you know, I'm just not going to do that standing. I'm a mover, blah, blah, blah. That's disrespectful. Um, right. Respectful is to go, you know, I really, I hate this standing stuff. I'm a, I'm a mover. And then you do it and you go, oh my God, I love this stuff. That, that, <laughs> that's, that's the real respect, you know, the real research. Right. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of the, uh, the other side. You know, when I first started training with Lloyd, I was interested in only Xingyi. I did not have any Bagua interest at all. It's like, Dude, I'm here for Xingyi. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I did get the the single palm change from him and a number of like Bagua foundational exercises, but I didn't really want to do the form, you know, it's so, like I'd circle walk with everybody else, but, you know, I'd go off with his son and do Xingyi. <laughs> and, and that was, that was just really all I wanted was Xingyi when we trained. And then as I got through it and then, you know, I started doing more Bagua, I was like, oh, okay, well, this is why <laughs> we need to do it. And then, um, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, one of those things we, we learn through experience, right? And the Chinese culture that, that kind of comes with these arts, it, it loses pieces and people... Um, you know, may not know the language or preserve things through the years. And so it, it kind of becomes something else. And there's these weird unwritten expectations for, you know, stuff. It's like, okay, dude, we're all American here. How about we just like be people? <laughs> well, you know, th this is, this is uh, not a problem, but this is a mystery that needs to be solved, especially right. if you're studying as an American, a Westerner with somebody who, um, is from from China, you know, Liang came from mainland China, Taiwan to Boston, Master Choi came from, uh, you know, Hong Kong to Chicago. Ken Cohen told me he gave me a great secret. So I, I wish I had discovered it. I didn't, but I stole it um, outright. <laughs> he told me he told me this. He said, when you ask a Chinese teacher a question, that's an insult because it means um, they didn't teach you. They didn't get the message across. And so in America, sometimes we ask a question to confirm. So if the teacher says the moon comes out at night, you say, excuse me, Sifu, um, can I ask you a question? Um, is it the moon comes out at night? You're just trying to confirm. Whereas mm -hmm. for them, it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't give you the right message. Right. And so one thing I found out is that the teachers who had a lot of experience teaching Westerners had no problems with questions. Even Master Choi, at the end of a, a lesson, he'd go, any questions? Or Master Liang would say, any questions? Um, and then I, I figured that out. And then uh, after a while, I, I realized, okay, this is this is a cultural thing. Um, once you figure that out, you could say, you know, I'm asking this question to confirm, or or let me make sure that I got this right, or, you know, I just need to, to, to do that. And I can tell you that that got me so far with a lot of, lot of teachers, whereas... Yeah, I did the thing where I asked a question and then like they were insulted and that right. like stopped the flow, you know, and, and like, that's oh, okay. what I'm talking about here is, is there's no reason to carry that forward, 
right? Like we don't need to carry that cultural artifact forward to our students, right? And so that that was one of the roadblocks that I had with learning from him was that, you know, he wanted people to like steal his art and figure it out. And, you know, it's like, come on, man, like, let's just talk. Like, let's, I don't want to have a, a huge puzzle. Like it's already bad enough that I have to go and learn Chinese if I actually want to read the stuff. You know? <laughs> Well, it's, you know, and now at this day and age, you know, 2022, um, for someone to come to class, that's huge. Right. Because there are so many things that people can sit in their house and watch the computer, do all this stuff. There's so many um, uh, uh, ways that people can spend their time. So if you're going to give me your time, t energy and attention, the last thing I'm going to do is hold back. Mm -hmm. You know, now there's definitely A, B, C, D. I, you know, I can't give you, you know, farther down the curriculum if you're in the beginning. But as far as like keeping secrets and all that, um, you know, that's just your, you know, that's just going to kill stuff. Yeah, exactly. And and that's one of the reasons that I I kind of stepped away from the Kenny Gong style of things is because, you know, we're told that you can't put the Nagong on video. Well, if you can't put the Nagong on video, how's it going to learn? Like the guy that has a certificate to teach doesn't even know the Nagong. Like, how's anybody going to learn the Nagong if it's not on video? <laughs> You know, and and so that's that's something that we keep coming across is like there's there's pieces that are being lost generation to generation because of this you know secrecy thing. Like we don't live in that time anymore. Like let's face it, if you want to go kill somebody, you can get a gun. You know. <laughs> well, there are no secrets. All, all the secrets of martial arts, the old fashioned secrets that the masters kept, they're on the internet. Right. What is what is the true secret? is the training method. How do you make this training become instinct? And then how does your training continue? Um, you know, that's, if you, you know, the old days, hey, here's the big secret. Yeah, dim mock. I mean, you know, it's, if you do a search on dim mock, it's all there. It's, right. it's in training. And, um, you know, it's already hard enough to get people to practice every day. That's, 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 there's one of my secrets, Matt. I always ask everybody daily practice to see if you're on the path. Because right. without daily practice, uh, I don't care what you do. If you do martial arts eight hours, one day a week, you're not going to get it. It's much better to do one hour every day or, or however much, you know, um, that it's the consistency, which is the, the secret.